Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome back to Dark Poutine. I am Mike Brown, the creator and host of the show. And I am Matthew. Who is the co-host of the show. The co-host. The co-host. Actually, we are the king and queen of Dark Bum, Poutine. Ba-da-dum. There you go. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate, Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. Your weekly dose of darkness. <laughs> oh boy. On November 25th, 2011, neighbors around the fourplex at 51st Avenue and 47th Street in the town of Innisfail, Alberta, heard a bang which shook their homes. Some said it sounded like a gunshot. Others said it sounded like someone dropping a heavy pile of wood. The dining room window of one of the corner suites had been blown outward. Glass was strewn throughout the yard. Police were called by a bystander inside the home, and when they arrived, they found a horrific scene. The home was full of smoke and debris. There, at the dining room table, still in her wheelchair, first responders discovered the body of 23-year-old Victoria Vicky Shakte, who died in what appeared to have been an explosion. You are listening to Dark Poutine episode 214, Innisfail Bombing, The Murder of Vicky Shakte. This story was suggested by longtime member of the Yumberyard and friend of the show, Jennifer Durrell. Thanks for reminding me of this one, Jennifer. It's another crazy case. Innisfail is a town in central Alberta, Canada. It is located in the Calgary-Edmonton Corridor, south of Red Deer, at the junction of Highway 2 and Highway 54. According to the Canadian Encyclopedia, Innisfail, a town of around 8,000 people, quote, is located on the CP rail line 121 kilometers north of Calgary. Originally known as Poplar Grove, the settlement emerged as a regular stopping place on the Calgary-Edmonton Trail during the early 1880s. In 1882, the Alberta Lumber Company of Montreal opened a grist mill near the eventual town site, which was surveyed the following year. Though the Northwest Rebellion of 1885 hindered settlement of the area, the rich soil, plentiful timber, and abundant wildlife began to attract numerous settlers shortly thereafter. With the arrival of the Calgary-Edmonton Railway in 1891, the first post office was opened in 1892, and a school district was established. The settlement was then renamed after the Irish town of Innisfail in 1892. It was incorporated as a village in 1899 and has remained the prosperous center of a mixed farming district. Significant oil discoveries in the area were made after World War II, and today local businesses cater to the servicing of the oil and natural gas industry that has developed since then. The town's entry in Wikipedia mentions locations of note as Home to the Danes Pro Rodeo, Anthony Henday Campground, Dr. George Kemphouse Museum, a beautiful historic downtown with unique stores, and the Historical Village Museum. Napoleon Trail's gravesite is also nearby. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police Dog Training Facility is located 
two kilometers south of Innisfail. Do you want to know something funny? Sure. So when you told me about this uh, episode, I looked up Innisfail and I was getting all excited about how beautiful this town is. I'm like, oh my God, it's so lush and so green. In Alberta. And I was like looking at like photos on, on the interweb and then I'm like, wait a minute, is that a palm tree? <laughs> then I'm like, wait a minute, is that an ocean? And I realized I was looking at Innisfail, Queensland, Australia, which is just south of Papua New Guinea. Yeah, not an away game. No. <laughs> <laughs> Victoria Vicky Shakte was born in 1988 to Luella and Victor Shakte. She was sister to three brothers, Chris, Trevor, and Derek. She had one sister, Sarah. She was said to have been a spirited and sometimes rebellious girl. She'd gone through some adversity in her young life, including the split of her parents. Vicky's mom had then married another man, Rick Bercier, who became stepdad. When Vicky was 16, however, an incident occurred that would immediately change her life. Vicky was involved in a car crash in 2004, which paralyzed her from the waist down, confining her to a wheelchair. She was pregnant at the time. Vicky's child miraculously survived and was given a name to match when she was born a month later. Destiny. The name of the town actually comes from the Irish language epithet for Ireland, which in this fail, which means Isle of Destiny. Isn't that cool? I yeah. wonder if that was intentional on their part. It probably was. I'd, I'll just assume that it Destiny was. Destiny from the Isle of Destiny. That's kind of nice, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It really is. As Vicky got used to life in a wheelchair, the first four years of her daughter's life were spent with her grandparents. In early 2008, as a result of the accident, Vicky received a settlement that after lawyer fees and other expenses was worth $575,000. Vicky sought out help to deal with her money, and a financial advisor in the area and friend of the family, Brian Andrew Malley, invested the money for her. Malley was also financial advisor to Vicky's mother and stepfather. At Malley's insistence, Vicky borrowed an additional $265,000 to up the investment. Vicky's investments took a nosedive in October and November of 2008 when there was a stock market crash and the investment lost $390,000. According to the Red Deer Advocate, later investigation indicated that, quote, close to 92% of the investment was in one stock, Enervest Diversified Income Trust. Shares were purchased at $6.31, but were sold at a loss of $3.18 per share, end quote. Ouch. Yeah. You gotta sp spread your money around. Yeah, it's that old adage, don't put all your eggs in one basket. But she was 17, 18 years old when she got her money. Honestly, she's from a small town. Mm -hmm. He's a friend of the family, right? Yep, yep. I'm sure there's a level of trust. She's probably not educated on investing like I am not educated. 100%. On investing. Yeah. I let my husband do it. Yeah. Um, because he's good at it. And just what happened to her is like everyone's worst nightmare. It is. Uh, somebody very close to me had that happen. Oh, um, trusted an individual with... Uh, a lot of their money, mm -hmm. and that person was asleep at the wheel when there were a few events economy-wise, and yeah. away went six figures of that person's money. Horrible. The year before the explosion that took her life, just as things seemed to be turning around for Vicky, her mom passed away. Even though she was receiving small payments from her investments to help pay the bills, Vicky got herself a job at the co-op gas station in town to make her dollars go further. Customers recalled her having a positive attitude despite her disability. It was at her church, though, Innisfail Alliance, where Vicky seemed to make the most impact. People there remembered her as an active member of the church community. She volunteered at a kids' craft program and attended a ladies' Bible study group. Vicky would turn up for church on Sundays in her van, specially fitted to accommodate her disabilities. A church friend of Vicky's named Marnie Rilling later recalled, quote, She had a more abundant and happy life in her chair than other people ever find, said Rilling, who described Vicky as determined, a dear friend, devoted mother, and faithful parishioner who was always seen with a Tim Hortons cup hanging precariously by her wheelchair every Sunday at church. 
end quote. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like she knows her well. I was worried that you're going to do a quote where she's like, she was so inspirational, mm -hmm. which I think is kind of demeaning, but she's just speaking to, about her like a normal human being. Right. Right. Yep. Of a friend who's in a wheelchair who hates this sort of we're heroes inspirational stuff. Yeah. She's like, I'm just a person. Yeah, like, exactly. Don't, don't, you, I know you're trying to do good, but it's just sort of demeaning because it just makes it all about the, about my, my wheelchair. Right. I worked with children with intellectual and, and physical disabilities uh, for years, and they were like that too. They they just wanted to fit in. They yeah. just they just want to. They're doing their best. Yep. They don't want people to see them for their disability. They want people to yeah. see them for their personality, their love of something creative. Their yeah. You know, just treat, yeah. treat me like me, not yeah. not not like I'm special because of this. Vicky's co-op job was okay, but she needed more cash. She thought perhaps the principal from her investments might help. She'd spoken with Brian Malley numerous times over the past few months asking about her investments, but he'd confused her with financial mumbo-jumbo. Vicky never seemed to be able to make heads or tails as to what he was telling her. In the summer of 2011, Vicky called Malley's office at Asante Wealth Management again to ask about her investments this time requesting an amount be transferred to her bank account directly. As Mally was away on a fishing trip, only his assistant, Barbara Tablus, was in the office. Barbara looked into Vicky's account and told the shocked young woman that her account had been closed. Mally, when questioned by Vicky, denied this, indicating that the money had been moved and, to prove it on October 15th, Mally paid Vicky another small amount he'd claimed were dividends from her investments. But Vicky had become suspicious of him. In early November, she asked Mally to return what was left of her money. Mally again apparently gave Vicky the runaround. On the morning of November 25, 2011, Vicky and her 30-year-old live-in caregiver Marlene Panongbion were getting ready to see Destiny off to school when they noticed a glitter-covered green Christmas bag at the front door. Inside was what appeared to be a cardboard box, on top of which was placed a piece of paper with Victoria's name on it. Vicky and Marlene brought the package inside and went out for about an hour. On the return, Vicky wanted to open the package. Marlene said she told Shakti to call the police, but Vicky wanted to open it. When she did, the explosion occurred, rattling homes nearby and killing Vicky Shakti instantly. Luckily, Marlene escaped with only minor injuries and then called the police who swarmed to the property. I wonder what prompted Marlene to tell her she should call the police. Like, what, what's so suspicious about a package that's wrapped up like a gift? Well, it was a bag. Yeah. And in the bag was... there the, the package inside the bag, I don't believe, was wrapped. Oh. So it was a Christmassy-looking package, okay. like bag... And it just had Victoria's name on a piece of paper. Okay. And Victoria was spelled incorrectly. There was a K in Victoria. V-I-C-K-T-O-R-I-A. Okay. So, well, maybe the person doesn't know how to spell your name properly. Uh, maybe it's, it, it, why is this package showing up? Nobody really knows. When I get a package at that, I just rip into that bitch. Right. <laughs> I, yeah. would have, I would have been blown up in two seconds. I don't know if I would. I'm a little more suspicious. Maybe. I, well, after this, I think I'm going to be. Well, I mean, doing this show, uh, if something showed up on my doorstep and it just says, Mike from Dark Poutine, I'm probably... With, with a C in Mike. Yeah. Yeah. I'm probably going to hesitate yeah. before opening it. Yeah. Because I'm not saying that somebody wants to blow me up, but... Uh, there could be, I don't know. I, I just don't feel comfortable getting anonymous stuff. I got an anonymous, uh, card in the mail once in London. Okay. Um, my name was spelled incorrectly. Yep. With two T's. And no, the last name. Oh, okay. And Stockman, they called me. Oh, Matthew Stockman. But it was a thank you note for saving this person's life. Well... <laughs> Of course, someone's going to send you a thank you note for saving someone's but, life. But I have no idea how I saved them, though. Oh, weird. Yeah. Isn't that strange? It is strange. Anyway. Matthew's a hero and don't even know <laughs> it. 
I, if I knew what I did, I'd repeat. RCMP spokesman Sergeant Patrick Webb held a press conference that day on the road some distance away from Vicky's house to give as much information as he could to the media who'd gathered after hearing of the explosion. Here's the audio of what he said as captured by the Red Deer Advocate newspaper. About 9 a.m. this morning, there was an explosion at a, a townhouse-style apartment here on 51st Avenue in Innisfail, Alberta. That explosion occurred inside the residence and resulted in the death of a 23-year-old female who was a resident at that uh, apartment. It also uh, um, contained, at the time, a woman who was in her 30s. She didn't suffer any serious injuries. The name of the deceased is not going to be released at this time because we are still doing next to notifications. Um, the examination of the scene is being completed by some RCMP experts we have in uh, explosive devices. At this time, we do not know what caused the explosion. That's why we're bringing in these experts. We've also brought our major crimes unit in. They're doing a, uh, the examination, uh, the investigation, I should say, into all aspects of this individual. At this time, we treat it as a murder, as we do normally with all unexplained sudden deaths. In other words, that gives us the um, direction to approach it with a collection of all possible evidence, interview all possible witnesses. We're not saying this is a murder at this time, but that's the approach that we take at this time. Uh, without knowing exactly what is the cause of this, uh, we have to explain that there, we do know there was a package delivered to this residence sometime in the early morning. We're not saying that this had anything to do with the actual explosion, but we are wanting the public to be aware and be mindful of any unanticipated uh, delivery of any packages. We certainly are not saying that is a cause of it, but we just want people to be aware of it. The investigation was no small affair, and according to the RCMP's website, it was a defining case for them. First, the Explosive Disposal Unit, EDU members present, checked the scene to make sure it was safe. For the safety of the other residents in the building, RCMP evacuated all the other suites, unsure whether there were more explosives present. From the RCMP's web article on this case, quote, RCMP chemist Nigel Hearns was on the scene too. Hearns, who works with the Trace Evidence Team at the RCMP's National Forensic Laboratory Services in Ottawa, brought an ion scanner to the blast site to detect things the human eye can't see and that could potentially compromise the scene. A tent was set up, and Hearns examined every person going in and out. We stopped one officer because we found trace amounts of explosives on their gear, says Hearns. It's kind of like if you get motor oil on your hands, you can't just wash it off with soap and water. According to the National Post, as of Sunday afternoon, the street surrounding Ms. Shackday's fourplex remained blocked off as police combed the surrounding neighborhood with sniffer dogs and sensors. At least 30 officers, including an explosive team flown in from RCMP's Ottawa headquarters, have now joined the investigation. A number of Vicky's friends spoke to the Toronto Star only days after the bombing. It's totally bizarre. This is something that you see happening in the movies or on TV. It's not reality said Rochelle Dubois Donahue, who is a close friend of the victim, Vicky Shakti. The whole town is struggling with this. There is no reason for it. Vicky had a heart of gold. She was the most beautiful person you could have met. Dave Weeb, a pastor at the Innisfail Alliance Church and a spokesperson for the Shakti family, said, quote, She was a wonderful mom, a wonderful lady, and just a great gal. They continue to be devastated by Vicky's death. Friend Rochelle Dubois Donahue also coordinated the children's program at the Innisfail Alliance Church. She said that Vicky was always eager to lend a helping hand. She was my right hand woman, Dubois Donahue told the Toronto Star. She would always be asking, What can I do? We'd spend hours doing craft prep. It takes a while when you're doing prep for 75 kids. It's shocking to all of us. End quote. Rochelle gave another interview to Calgary Herald in which she spoke of her friend, Vicky, and how devastated she was by Vicky's death. Incredulous, Rochelle asked a question that was on almost everyone's mind. Of all the people in Innisfail, why Vicky? In a letter to the Shakte family printed in the Red Deer Advocate, Scott Douglas of Stetler recalled his interactions with Vicky. He wrote, quote, I'm writing in regards to Vicky Shakte, who was killed in Innisfail. I knew Vicky very well and appreciated her very much. 
I got to know her in the Glenrose Hospital doing rehab there after my accident. I was always inspired by her attitude even after her accident. I was in the hospital with her for approximately one month, and that month was the best part in my life. She got me to realize that life goes on even being in a wheelchair. I've often thought about this and have cried about it too. I wanted to tell you as a family, I wish I could be there for you during this hard time, but you are in my thoughts and prayers. End quote. Vicky's funeral was held on December 3, 2011 at the Innisfail Alliance Church. From the Edmonton Journal, quote, More than 200 people attended the service and dozens of Shakti's friends and family wore red-hooded sweatshirts that bore the words, Free to Dance, a reference to a favorite Christian song of Shakti's, who spent hours volunteering at the Innisfail Alliance Church where the memorial service was being held. Among the crowd was Shakti's father, siblings, and stepfather. As he left the service, Shakti's eldest brother Chris said that the family is doing their best to move on. We'd like to see some closure as far as the investigation goes. It's a bizarre thing, and to know it was targeted on top of it. We don't know who would want to do something so crazy. According to mountainviewtoday.ca, Vicky's older brother Chris said, quote, Becoming paralyzed was her greatest challenge. Destiny was her salvation. She rebounded and moved forward, end quote. Destiny was placed in the care of Vicky's family. According to her brother Trevor, Vicky hadn't an enemy in the world, but there was at least one person who wanted the young woman dead. But again, who and why? And we'll take a break right here. And we are back. Uh, Matthew. What are your thoughts on this episode so far? The person who did this yeah. is going to have it blow up in his face, pun intended. Yeah. Right? Like, to bomb someone to death is really extreme way to murder. Is a, It's a really extreme way to mur murder somebody. Yes, it is. Like, it, 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 it's almost always connected to, like, somebody wanting to make a very public statement or to terrorize an organization or a community or a nation, right? Yeah, I get into that later on. Okay. And the inevitability of bombing making national and international, international news, right? Which happens in this case mm -hmm. only leads to public outcry, which leads to police really wanting to figure it out. Sure. Which means you're going to have more people on your ass. Yeah. It's going to, there's going to be more eyes on it. Right. And so she was, she was a normal person like all of us. She wasn't some group leader or a politician. No, not at all. It says to me, like, she was killed for a personal reason, but the person who did it, he made a huge mistake in doing it this way. But maybe the person who did it thought, this is so extreme. If I do it this way, it will divert attention from me to somebody else because why on earth would I want to do something like this? Well, we'll probably figure that out. And plus, the callousness of this method. So her friend was with her, wasn't really hurt. No. She could have let her daughter open it. Oh, look, we got a package. Why don't you open it up, sweetie? Right. Right? Like he... he it was there on the doorstep in the morning when, right. when they Right. So got whoever up. did this has like no care about the carnage of how many people get hurt. No. No, it's pretty cold. It's very cold. RCMP spoke with Brian Andrew Malley on November 28, 2011, three days after the explosion that had killed Vicky Shakti. When questioned about how Vicky's money had disappeared... He claimed it was Vicky herself who had drained the account, that she was not financially responsible. When asked about who might have wanted to kill Vicky Shakti, Mally told police that Vicky and her brother Derek had often argued about money and that there might be a connection to drugs that they should look into. Although the RCMP did look into other leads, many of them pointed right back to Brian Malley. At the site of the explosion, RCMP specialist Hearns actually found explosives that had not ignited. Later in the lab, a colleague used a lead-based isotope technique to identify the solder used to join electronic parts together. The RCMP forensic team investigating the crime scene carefully recovered a number of items which they believed to be remnants of a pipe bomb, which was composed of a galvanized steel pipe with threads at both ends, 6 inches long and 2 inches in diameter two galvanized steel end caps, two inches in diameter, double-based smokeless gunpowder, a Cooper brand toggle light switch, 18-gauge primary white electrical wiring, solder, 
Dorsey brand Krypton light bulbs, and an Ever Ready brand lantern battery. According to court documents, quote, further investigation by the RCMP revealed that Malley had purchased many of the same items in the months before the explosion. Police searched Malley's home and found unused gunpowder, two soldering irons, Dorsey brand Krypton light bulbs, a small rubber black cap used to cover lantern batteries similar to the one mentioned, and gift bags. Malley claimed that he had purchased those items for hunting, Christmas decorations, and his part-time home construction business, end quote. But it was good old DNA that helped the RCMP get their man. Forensic laboratory analysis found traces of DNA on the paper label taped to the box that had exploded. Between January and May of 2012, police had Malley under surveillance on 10 different occasions. They were hoping that he would leave a viable DNA sample behind that would allow them to test against the sample they'd collected. Malley had left behind a napkin that he used at a Wendy's restaurant. An eagle-eyed, undercover RCMP officer snagged the napkin and carefully placed it into an evidence bag. It was tested, and sure enough, there was a hit. The DNA on the paper attached to the box was a close match to the sample they'd obtained from Brian Andrew Malley's napkin. It was not conclusive, but with all the other evidence RCMP had collected, it made a convincing case against Brian Andrew Malley. <laughs> there you go, right? Yeah. Like I was saying earlier, almost inevitable that you're going to get caught when you do something so extreme. Mm -hmm. He had a connection to her. Right. Right. So there's motive. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Probably suffered from hubris thinking he wasn't going to get caught. Most people who would do something like this would think that they weren't going to get caught. Yeah. yeah. Kept the materials in his house, mm -hmm. left DNA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've never done this, but I could have schooled him on how to do it better. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. There are really weird elements to this. And this woman, ah, she so did not deserve this. Not at all. She had so, like, the accident, her mom dying, losing money. Right. Right? It was one thing after another for her, and she just kept <laughs> bouncing back and just doing her thing. And this jerk off. Oh, my God. Yeah. On May 25th, 2012, Brian Andrew Malley was arrested for Vicky Shackday's murder. He was charged with first-degree murder, intending to cause an explosion likely to cause death or serious bodily harm, and intending to cause death or serious bodily harm by delivering to someone an explosive substance. He was held in custody at the remand center in Red Deer. RCMP held a press conference to speak about the arrest. Here's some audio, again captured by the Red Deer Advocate newspaper. First, you'll hear RCMP Superintendent Curtis Zablocki, and then Vicky's dad, Victor, with daughter Sarah at his side, as he says a few words. November 25th, 2011, was a very sad and tragic day when here at Innisfail, 23-year-old Victoria Shakte opened a package addressed to her that was left on the front steps of her residence. That package exploded. Victoria resided in a fourplex unit with her seven-year-old daughter, and live-in care providers. She had been confined to a wheelchair since 2004 as a result of injuries sustained in a motor vehicle collision. The resulting explosion that morning took her life and put in motion a homicide investigation that would span the following six months. Over this past weekend, the person alleged to be responsible for her death, Brian Malley, aged 55 years, of Innisville, Alberta, was arrested and charged with first-degree murder in the death of Victoria Chacte. Oh, this is, this is just great news for us. The, the, the family is, is, is um, experiencing a lot of uh, uh, trepidation that this fellow was still out in, in the general public. And we're just so happy that the fellows down here got it done in such a speedy manner. While in custody, Malley asked his friend and business partner to buy a certain type of gunpowder for him from a specific store that he and the man had been to a year before. Malley was claiming he needed it because the RCMP were, quote, setting him up and were going to lose one of his containers of gunpowder. I don't understand this. Why is he buying more gunpowder and why ask a friend to buy it instead of buying it himself? 
Well, he's probably A, hoping that the friend isn't going to tell anybody that he's bought it for him. And B, he'll say, well, no, look, look here, legal system. Yeah. I have the gunpowder that you say was used in the, the blast. Oh, what a tangled web we weave. Right? So it can't have been used because I have the exact amount that I bought. Such a cock knocker. On June 29, 2012, much to the shock of Vicky's family, although charged with first-degree murder, Brian Malley was released on $20,000 bail. Until the time of his trial set for Red Deer, he was ordered to live at his mother-in-law's residence in Edmonton. While there in 2013, Malley was doing some home repairs around his mother-in-law's place. He was now claiming that during repairs, he'd used the pipe and two end caps that he'd bought in July of 2011. Malley said that it was impossible that they had been used in the bomb that had killed Vicky Shakte. From the Red Deer Advocate, quote, May 2014, ATCO comes to move the gas meter at the Edmonton residence. A day before, Malley with defense counsel Bob Alanesi and Don Crystal, a hired private investigator, videotaped the cutting of concrete and the extraction of a steel pipe with two end caps. September 2014, Crystal turns the pipe and end caps over to the RCMP investigators. Why were they taking a video? Am I being slow here? No, you're not okay. being slow. This is probably his defense team. On the information that Brian Malley has given them, I'm not saying the defense team is trying to manufacture something. No, they're trying to, to do their jobs, probably. They're trying yeah. to do their jobs. Malley has said, well, the end caps and the piece of pipe were used. Oh, to, he fixed the thing for his mom, right. mom. And so they're like, okay, let's go get it to show. Okay. Exactly. I see. Okay. Exactly. So, yeah, look, here it is. But, I mean... Buying those kind of end caps and a pipe at that length is not a rare thing. And it, it probably, it may not have even been the first time he bought those things. Yeah. So according to investmentexecutive.com, in April of 2014, the Investment Industry Regulatory Organization of Canada, IIROC, announced that following a disciplinary hearing on March 3rd, a hearing panel found that former rep Brian Malley violated IIROC rules by failing to cooperate with an IIROC investigation, failing to know the essential facts of 12 of his clients, making unsuitable recommendations to 10 clients, and engaging in discretionary trading in the accounts of 7 clients. A class action lawsuit was filed by those 10 clients to hold him accountable. The IIROC permanently banned Brian Malley and fined him $300,000 after finding that he failed to ensure his recommendations to 10 clients were suitable and that he engaged in discretionary trading in the accounts of 7 of the 10 clients. Christine Malley, Brian's wife, was also permanently banned and fined $250,000 for failing to supervise her husband as the branch manager. They did not appear at the IIROC hearing or contest the allegations. End quote. Cowards not even showing up. Well, here's the thing. If I'm a defense lawyer, yeah. I'm going to counsel my client and yeah, yeah, his that. wife from showing up because if there's an investigation... This shit will be recorded. All of this will be okay, recorded yeah. and can later be used against you at trial. Okay. So it makes sense that they didn't show up. That was probably some good lawyering on their defense attorney's part. I like to think they're cowards as well. I would say, I, I don't know. <laughs> In voir dire hearings held before the beginning of Malley's trial, his defense team claimed inadequate investigation on the part of the RCMP regarding the case. They argued that there were seven different individuals or groups of individuals whose grudges and or behavior may have been able to create reasonable doubt as to Malley's responsibility in Vicky Shakte's murder. They were the owner of the vehicle that had injured Vicky in the 2004 accident, the driver of the vehicle that injured Vicky in the 2004 accident, a teenager with a grudge against Vicky's landlord, 
a local teenager who claimed to have burned off his eyebrows while making a bomb, an individual who had supposedly made statements 10 to 15 years prior that he could send a bomb that appeared to be a gift, two young men who had set off firecrackers at appliances, and Rob from Airdrie and other possible associates of the victim or her brothers, Trevor and Derek, who may have targeted the victim as a, quote, drug hit. The judge refused to allow the defense to present this as it seemed like quite a stretch of reality. Probably is. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking while you're saying that, you know, this is what defense lawyers do. Yeah. You know, it's their job to cast reasonable doubt by naming other potential culprits. 100%. We can't blame them for doing their jobs. We've right. seen many times... When defense lawyers do this and actually end up finding justice and the real killer being caught mm -hmm. and innocent people being charged with murder being cleared, yeah, then they're heroes. But when they do it and the people aren't cleared, they're seen as demons. They're just doing their job. Right. right. Yeah. Totally they are. Um, it's very interesting, though. Um, again, they're probably acting on a lot of information from uh, Mally himself. Of course. And they're also... Uh, they had a private detective who or private investigator who did all a lot of footwork and maybe the RCMP didn't talk to some of these people in the way that the defense felt that they should. Let me ask you a question. Shoot. If you did something mm -hmm. and the lawyer comes in, you say, I did it, but you have to get me off. Yep. Do they have to ignore that you said that or do they have to recuse themselves or anything? No, they have to find a legal means to defend you. Okay. That's all that they have to do. Okay. You can tell them, yes, I did it, but it is still their job to defend you. Okay. Maybe he did just that. Maybe Mally came in and said, yeah, I did it, but I want you guys to help me get off. They still have to do all these things, you know? If you're a lawyer and somebody says, I did it, can you say, I'm not going to represent you? I don't know if you can. Okay. I don't know if you can. I don't, okay. uh, I'm not quite sure what the legal ramifications would be for the lawyer. Uh, maybe if a, another lawyer can contact the show and answer that question for us, that would be a really interesting yeah, bit I'd of like information. Yeah, I'd like to know, because on TV shows, right, mm -hmm. you never see the accused telling the... I, mean, I can't think of a show or a movie right now. I've seen some, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It just seems weird. It is weird. Like, I I wouldn't want to try to get somebody off if they're like, yeah, I did it, but you have to get me. I wouldn't want to. Maybe this is why I'm not a lawyer. Maybe that's why you're not a lawyer. Okay. And and this is probably why lawyers get such a bad name too, is that kind of thinking. Yeah. So Mally's trial for Vicky Shakti's murder went ahead in early 2015. Over five weeks, the jury heard from the Crown the tale of a man who'd killed a disabled single mother after stealing her money. The Crown believed Mally had taken Vicky's money for himself and the dividend payments he'd been giving to Vicky Shakti, $44,000 in total since her initial investment, had come out of Mally's own pocket. According to CBC News, Mally's defense team had different thoughts. Quote, There's an easier way to cut your losses. You just stop paying, defense lawyer Bob Alanessi told the jury in his closing address. Mr. Mally is being prosecuted because he cares for people. In this case a single mom in a wheelchair, end quote. Something odd happened during the trial. On February 6, 2015, the trial judge informed counsel that court security officers and seven jurors had expressed concerns that Mally's wife, Christine, was taking pictures or videotaping the jury with a cell phone or tablet camera. The judge adjourned the trial to allow counsel time to consider their positions on this issue and make submissions. The jurors were polled to inquire about their concerns regarding Christine Malley's behavior. One juror in particular indicated some concern but said that she could fulfill her oath and was kept on the panel. Christine Malley was directed not to attend the courthouse unless and until she was needed to testify. Malley's defense stuck with the tactic that the RCMP had not adequately investigated and that Malley had not stolen any money from Christine nor did he know how to make a pipe bomb or any other type of explosive. Ultimately, it came down to the decision of the jury. Malley was found guilty of all three charges. He was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for at least 25 years on the first-degree murder charge, and two years each on the other charges, to be served concurrently. Malley lost his subsequent appeals. In October 2015, 
the Investment Industry Regulatory Organization of Canada, IIROC, announced that a hearing panel accepted a settlement agreement with Toronto-based Asante Capital Management Limited that will see the firm pay a $400,000 penalty and $30,000 in costs for failing to properly supervise a branch in Red Deer, where Brian and Christine Malley were employed. Vicky's daughter, Destiny, is said to be doing as well as she can and is with people who support her and love her very much. Bombings that have occurred within Canada, and there have been a few, have typically been related to politically motivated terrorism, as we mentioned, like the multiple bombings undertaken by the FLQ, the bombing of Air India Flight 182, the 1965 bombing of the Yugoslav Consulate in Toronto, at the hands of Croatian nationalists, and the bombing of giant mine in Northwest Territories that killed six during a 1992 labor dispute. The number of instances of bombings not related to political or other causes shrinks drastically. Other than Vicky Shakti's story and a handful of others, there is one case that stands out to me. I know this unsolved case well and was reminded of it during my research into Vicky's story. Call it a bonus story if you like. On Thursday, December 12th, 1996, just after 1 p.m. on a 40-hectare farm belonging to self-employed mechanic and machinist Wayne Grivet in Pushlinch Township near Guelph, Ontario, an oblong package arrived. It had been sent by way of Canada Post. The package was wrapped in clean white paper and adorned with a ribbon. The message attached said, quote, didn't realize you'd moved, had some trouble finding you, have a Merry Christmas, and may you never have to buy another flashlight, end quote. Unwrapping the package reveal a cardboard container that had once contained a wine bottle. Inside that was a black Duracell floating lantern flashlight with a black and yellow lens cap. Wayne Grivet's 21-year-old son Justin grabbed the flashlight and tried the switch. Nothing happened. Wayne himself took the flashlight from his son and flicked the switch on, which resulted in a tremendous explosion that killed Wayne Gravett instantly. Justin suffered minor burns from the blast, and Wayne's wife Diane and his brother Robert just across the room from Wayne were unharmed physically, but severely traumatized by seeing Wayne's sudden and violent death. No one has yet been brought to justice for Wayne's murder. Wanting to solve the case, police have taken the unusual step of releasing a significant amount of the evidence gathered in the hope of jarring someone's memory about the very specific things that they discovered. The flashlight, apparently, had been camouflaged for what was really an improvised explosive device meant to kill Wayne Gravette. The explosive utilized was a type used in mining, and the case of the flashlight contained scores of roofing nails that acted as high-speed projectiles and ended up embedded in Mr. Gravette and the walls, ceiling, and furniture of the room. Somehow, a letter attached to the package had survived the blast. The letter read, quote, My partners and I are opening a new business sometime early in the new year called Acton Home Products and would be very interested in having you give us a price on rebuilding some equipment. You did some work for a company I was with a few years ago, and although you won't remember me, name withheld, and your delivery man, name withheld, most likely will. We don't plan on doing anything until after the new year, but would be most anxious to proceed at that time. We have no staff or office in place yet, but you can reach us by mail at our new address below. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to hearing from you sometime early in the new year. End quote. The address mentioned, of course, was a fake, as was the signature at the bottom naming a person who never existed. The letter itself, though, had been typed with a Smith Corona typewriter using a daisy wheel font model 10 slash 12, number 59543, specific only to 2% of Smith Corona typewriter owners at the time. The daisy wheel used in this typewriter also left a slash after each period, an unusual anomaly thought in all likelihood to be unique to this typewriter or possibly the typist. Hairs that did not belong to anyone known to have handled the package were found on the wrapping. However, it is unclear whether the police have been able to acquire DNA or any other leads using those. 
There were also flyers for a local lumber yard included inside the packaging, but those have proven useless to the investigation so far. As well, investigators discovered that in the month before Wayne's murder, two men, as yet identified, came into the Acton Post Office asking about Wayne Gravett's address. Wayne's wife, who never spoke to the media until 2001, upset at suggestions that Wayne might have been involved in some sort of organized crime, wanted to clear the air, have her say, and ask the public for help. She said, quote, I know him for the man he was. He was well-loved and respected by all of us. We had a good family home. I know we didn't hurt anybody. We didn't rip anybody off. We didn't owe anybody any money. End quote. She went on to implore that anyone with information on Wayne's killing please come forward. Wayne's family set up two web addresses with information about Wayne's murder, unsolvedmurders.ca and unsolvedcrimes.ca. Both addresses contain the same information, including news articles and more on Wayne Gravett's murder. If you have any information, please leave a tip via the email page on unsolvedcrimes.ca or, or you can call the Ontario Provincial Police and quote file 001-46-9843 or you can call Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-TIPS. That's 1-800-222-8477. Oddly, in 2002... Pavo Paul Henneton, 54, another mechanic, was stabbed to death in his Georgetown apartment building after a night out. According to a news article, quote, two days after the murder, Henneton's 1997 green Chevrolet truck was found at Mountain View Road and Dominion Gardens Drive, its interior also stained with blood, end quote. Henneton and Gravette had known each other and had worked in the same business. Henneton's murder is also unsolved. It is not clear if the two killings are related in any way. Like, what a weird case this one is. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, the, you want to say where there's smoke, there's fire. Right. You want to say something smells, but there's no proof of anything. Right. It's just all weirdness and... People were, people have assumed or have... People have presumed that it might just be somebody thought he charged too much or he didn't return equipment in time or it could have been something like a little thing that set off an insane person. Right. You know? Okay. Like. Um, somebody that has a grudge that mm -hmm. didn't, it, not such a large thing, just somebody that really held on to some smaller slight. Right. Okay. Exactly. It could have been something like that. Who like got slighted by many others and just thought he'd take it out on mm -hmm. this guy. Okay. Or it could have been some huge conspiracy, but we, uh, we don't know at this point. It's no. really, really strange. So, yeah, I am I would like to see this one solved, uh, Wayne Grivet's, uh case solved, because I've yeah, followed it a bit. It's even really if, weird. Even if he did something horrible. Mm-hmm. And not saying he did it all. He, there's no proof that he's done anything. Whatever he did or didn't do, you doesn't you do don't deserve this. No, right? No, it's especially just, it, again. Even if he was like he probably was just a normal guy, but like there's no reason to do this to somebody. And the way it was done again, uh, his son took the flashlight yeah. out of his hand and was like, "Okay, like God, I want to turn it on." Can you imagine? Whole family was there, right? And w what? Why on earth? It, again, it's like if you want to, if you want to murder somebody, yeah. if you want to murder somebody, this is not the best way to go about it. No, somebody. If somebody knows something, they should come forward because this poor woman needs closure. Or better yet, don't murder people at all. There's that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But if they, if you, somebody knows something, they should, you know. Yeah, you have to think about. Imagine sort of carrying that grief for so long and you don't know why or what happened or who did it, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. And there are a lot of families out there who have these kind of questions. Mm. And that's it for Dark Poutine episode 214, Innisfail Bombing, The Murder of Vicky Shakti. That's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1-877-327-5786 or 1-877-DARK-PTN. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week.
Well, I think we have some voicemails to do, so let's listen to the first one. <laughs> anyway, you totally made my day. And um, I'm a long time in healthcare, used to te teach anatomy and physiology. And um, I have my own description for describing the perineum, and I'll just say it very quickly because <laughs> you probably don't want to hear a long message. Anyway, I always tell my students that it is in a man, it is between the legs, the area that extends from wherever the scrotum ends to the hole. I don't call it the hole, but anyway. <laughs> I want a t-shirt. I want a special edition t-shirt. It says, no, it doesn't say dark poutine. I want to say dark perineum. <laughs> and I don't know, whatever else you think. Anyway. I, I'm st uh, I'm going to laugh about this every time I think about it. Just perineum, tongue, and hole. Bang. <laughs> oh, anyway, I just want to let you know that it was very much appreciated by somebody uh, who was supposed to be doing work but was listening to your awesome podcast instead. Take care, guys. Bye. Oh, dear. And she called back again. And we'll we'll comment on all of that in a moment. But uh, yeah, she called back for a second time, which is interesting. Hi, Mike and Matthew. This is Lori again. I'm so sorry. I don't know. I am calling you back because I really wanted to say that I lived in London for years. I'm very familiar with the Grand Theater. Been there lots. Garlic's all that. Anyway, next time I'm in London, I'm going to drive by the Grand Theater and I'm going to imagine that arch as something different. Um, yeah, just had to get that in there. And it, also it helps me procrastinate. <laughs> okay, take care. Bye. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Lori, that's hilarious. So, yeah, I think I need to make a, a shirt that says it's dark poutine, not dark the perineum <laughs> or perineum. She said perineum. So I guess that's the way it's pronounced because a uh, physiology teacher. Oh, that's hilarious. Holy crap. She was just <laughs> laughing the whole time. Oh my God. I was so embarrassed last week. Yeah. Like it just slipped out. Yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, we, 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 followed, <laughs> we followed up with some other things that were funny as well. So that was fun. Let's, let's listen to another voicemail. Oh, hey fellas. It's a uh, great big Pete here calling from my perineum arch, uh, here in Ottawa. Anyways, I just thought I'd call to say that the Ambrose small murder mystery episode that just came out was really phenomenal. I learned about Ambrose small, somebody who I knew nothing about before. And y'all have such a miraculous way of, keeping me informed and entertained at the same time. So keep it up, fellas. Good work. And uh, I love you. And uh, this is Great Big Pete signing off from the Perennium Arch. All right. Bye. Wow. Thank you, GBP. <laughs> so two Perennium Arch calls. <laughs> hilarious. Uh, yeah, I, I suspected we might get some, some interesting voicemails in that regard. And we did. Not surprised. Uh, let's move on. I think we have another voicemail. Hi, Mike and Matthew. Jamie here. This is my second attempt. Uh, please feel free to delete the first one. I just wanted to let you know, I did send some donut money at the beginning of March. Um, I sent it through via email, not PayPal. Um, and I also sent a follow-up email with it, just providing a little bit more insight um, from a different perspective on our mental health because we cannot talk about it enough. Um, kudos to you guys. Love what you do. Um, love Steve. And uh, go take a poop in your toque. Bye. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Thank you so much. And yeah, I do agree. We need to, as a, a society, need to talk about mental health more often and uh, remove that stigma because, you know, just because someone is depressed or has some sort of mental struggle does not mean they're someone we should shun. Mm. So, you know, yeah, we see that the streets of big cities are full of people who are mentally ill, you know? Yeah, Vancouver is a prime example. Yeah, there are people who 
if you go downtown, they are yelling at the top of their lungs at people who aren't there. I live downtown. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, all the way up to the top floor. Yeah. It's, um, I feel bad. Yeah. It's, yeah, something's got to. It always makes me sad that mental illness is, it doesn't appear to be something that the voices never seem to be nice. Do you know what I mean? Like, maybe I guess that's why we don't hear about it. Yeah. But I wonder if people do have actual nice voices and tell them nice things. That would be, that would be kind of interesting. That would be interesting. To learn. Yeah. I, I don't know if that's even a thing. Yeah, you should look it up. I'm a complete ignorant on this. So if, if people know of that, I'd love to hear it. Uh, let's listen to our last voicemail. <laughs> so close to hanging up now, but hi, Mike and Matt. My name's Ashley. I'm from Kamloops, BC. I'm a former resident of Richmond. Uh, I just wanted to say hi for the first time. I've been listening for four years. Having pod a podcast produced so close to home brings me so much joy, regardless of the topic, way to represent British Columbia and Canadians with your passion. Uh, I just wanted to drop a quick little tip about what's going down here, true crime land. Um, bit of drama for Kamloops last week, a popular computer science professor from Thompson Rivers University went missing. This week, a lawyer who lives about two blocks from my house is being investigating, investigated uh, for being in connection with a band found with the professor's possibly dismembered body. A bit too close to home, but maybe one day you can figure out the rundown for us. Thanks for doing what you do. Love you always. And uh, go take a shit in your hat, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that it's a really weird case that I have been following. And uh, police were called to the 1600 block Monterey place around 10 p.m. on uh, Thursday, uh, in on a Thursday late March. And it's really, really interesting uh, what's come out after that. It's a really weird case, and I'm not sure how that's going to shake out, but I have a feeling it will be one that will be of interest to the people in the sh uh, who listen to the show. So yeah, really, really weird. Mm -hmm. Very weird. So thanks for your call, Ashley. Uh, and Kamloops has, has gotten itself a, a bit more news lately. Um, I noticed yesterday that McDonald's is pulling out of Kamloops downtown because of, they claim, violent incidents, a number of violent incidents downtown. So the McDonald's restaurants are pulling out of hmm. uh, downtown Kamloops, which is what? That's very weird. So if anybody wants to call the show and talk about that specifically, uh, we'll play it next week if it's, if it's a good voicemail. So yeah, please call us with more information about what the heck is going on with McDonald's. In Kamloops. In Kamloops. Very, very weird. That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or one 877 We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. All right, it's time for Patreon and Donut Money shoutouts. It is first up... Uh, new patron, Christy McGonigal. And Hello, Christy. Christy is from Fort Capel, Fort Saskatchewan. Fort Capel. Fort Capel. Hmm. It's Q, U, apostrophe, A-P-P-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. Okay. okay. Yeah. So uh, what does Christy McGonigal do there in Fort Capel? She's a professional soccer player. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Good for her. Yeah, I was at a soccer game last night. Did you enjoy it? I know you like rugby more because I of I did. Men's it was mums. good company. So my friend Jen took me. Mm -hmm. And I have to do a shout out to Tegan and Jordan because uh, very nice people. And they're fans of the show by chance, which was cool. I like that. Yeah. So thank you, Christy. Uh, so she, yeah, so Christy plays for the Capellers. <laughs> the Capeller, the Capel Propellers. <laughs> the, the Capel Propellers professional soccer team. Well, there you go. Uh, next, we have our good friend, Darren McDonald, a Yumbriarder Darren. from Brantford, Ontario. Thank you, Darren. And uh, what does Darren do there in Brantford? Used car salesman. 
used cars. Yeah. Does he spe- sell a specific brand of used cars or? Uh, Fords. Fords. Uh, we used to joke uh, as non Ford fans, fixed or repaired daily is what Ford stands for. <laughs> and my cousin, who really likes Ford Mustangs, said, No, Ford stands for first on race day. Oh, yeah. But Darren's like the number one salesperson. He is. Yep. Well, there you go. Yep. Well, that's great, Darren. Thank you so much. Next, we have from D- Regina, Saskatchewan, another Yumber Yarder, Cheryl Ditter. Oh, Cheryl. She's back again. Hello, Cheryl. Well, thank you so much, Cheryl. And I can't remember what job we gave Cheryl the last time, but we'll, I think she's moved. I think she's transitioned to a new career. I think she just is now. She just is. Yeah. Well, maybe she's like, a, she's a mystic then. She's this, she's this. She has ascended? She's ascended. She kind of floats everywhere and she is. She's in everything now. Well, that's very nice. Yeah. Well, thank you, Cheryl. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like it when people just are. And just ascend. Yeah, they just ascend. <laughs> what have you done today? I ascended. I ascended. I'm now part of everything. I had nothing better to do, so I ascended. I am the universe. I am the universe. We all are, Matthew. It's kind of funny how that works. Well, that's what I... Anyway, I'm... And of course, I'm a crazy person. So, anywho, next... Let's get into some donut money donut folks. Uh, it looked like we had one donut money donor, and that is Manjot Singh. And Manjot is from Surrey, British Columbia. Surrey. Surrey in the house. That's where we are right now. It is where we are right now. And I, I can wonder s- if I can see house from here. It's close. Okay. Let's just say it's close. Wow. But uh, so thank you, Manjot. Thanks, Manjot. Much appreciated. And uh, yeah, it's really cool that. You're like literally a neighbor. A neighbor. Yeah. And it, we said last week, like, some people from Surrey, we haven't seen many. So there we go. There we go. <laughs> Manjot one. came in. Boom. Manjot, come to a, a, a meetup when we have one. Yeah. It, it would be great to meet you. It really would. Anywho, that is it for Donut Money and Patreon. Thanks to all our patrons and Donut Money donors past and present for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash dark poutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us Donut Money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening. And tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. Until we return, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Good morning, good afternoon, and good night. And good good and tog. I don't know. <laughs> we are crazy people. And like I'm using crazy in the in the not like mentally ill. Yeah. I'm just saying we're just crazy. You, you are bonkers. Eccentric, maybe. Eccentric. Would you, I'm not eccentric. Mm, <laughs> okay. Neither am I. No, okay. rich people are eccentric. Okay, then we can't be eccentric. Like Alistair Crowley was eccentric. So we're just bonkers. Right. So we're just bonkers. Yep. Yep. Anyway, goodbye from two bonkers people. Bye.